All right. Hello, hello, everyone out there, and welcome back to another installation of Blueprint's Careers in Law series. I am Matt Riley, CEO of Blueprint, and I am super duper excited. I just said super duper. Uh, for our guest today, I have Mr. Andres Olguin Flores, uh, who is an attorney at MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Education and Defense Fund. Uh, Andres, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate the time. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much, Matt, for having me. I mean, this is a privilege just to be able to connect with everyone and connect with you personally on this Zoom because, you know, with all these crazy times, it's nice to just be able to see another face. So yeah. thank you for having me. <laughs> as close as we get to personal connection. Hey, it's all good. I like it. <laughs> we'll soak it in. Soak it in. Uh, well, Dre, I have to take a few moments and just comment. We, uh, we were doing this series to give people kind of a, a look behind the curtain, if you will, a look into the life of a lawyer. And I gotta tell you, you're giving us a good look right now. You got some solid surroundings right there. I see it, I believe that might be a Dodgers game on behind you. Uh, <laughs> yep, you got it, you got it. <laughs> You got the cozy chair to get through hours of legal research. So it is, it is quite a setup you got. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> that is pretty on point. So you got it. <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, so we have lots to cover today. So we will jump in. Before we do, I wanted to give uh, one quick note to everybody joining us today. So feel free. I want this to be a nice interactive conversation. Uh, Andres is friendly enough to agree to answer questions if we have them. So uh, Phoebe from Blueprint will be manning the chat box. But if you have questions you want us to pass on, feel free. Uh, let's make sure that we have all the questions covered. Um, so let's jump in. So uh, Andres, I'd like to, so before we get to your experience, I'd like to give people a little bit of background on what we're doing here. Uh, so we started this careers in law series. It's actually been something that I've been hoping to do for a long time. Um, I've worked with, I've worked personally with thousands of students, but Blueprint has worked with thousands and thousands of students over the years. And I feel like there's this gap in the understanding. A lot of these people are taking on this big commitment law school and student loans and all the rest of it without clear understandings of what law school looks like and what life as a lawyer looks like. And there's all these diverse career paths that you can go after. Um, a lot of different opportunities uh, open up for you after law school. So we're kind of digging into a lot of them to give people a glimpse into what life as a lawyer looks like. Uh, and then specifically, we started off this month with a look at people working in areas of public interest and social justice. Uh, I was super, very excited about starting off that way, considering everything going on in the country and the spotlight on what's happening, issues of racism, inequality, and just this push right, to affect change in society. And so I really wanted to help people understand how lawyers are involved in that process. It might not be the glamorous courtroom dramas that you see on TV, but people need to understand that lawyers are working tirelessly on the front lines to protect the people who may not have the resources to protect themselves. And so I appreciate you joining us today because I think you can shed a lot of light on exactly those issues. Thank you. I mean, honestly, that epitomized in a lot of ways what our work is, so that's a great introduction. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So let's do it. So I want to spend a lot of our time on the work that you're doing today, because I find it super fascinating, but I also like to give a little bit of context. So let's go back in time a little bit and talk about how the little version of you got to this point. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going, to take you, I'm going to take you back in a time machine and actually ask you, like, how did the idea of becoming a lawyer first spring into your mind? Like, had you always wanted to be one? Did you watch the TV shows and think you wanted to act like that person? Give us a little bit of the background. Well, great question. So I, I have to admit, my father is a civil rights attorney. But from the day I was born, to now, he always discouraged me from going down the lawyer path because he was like, this, you know, if you're trying to do public interest work, it's, it's, 
many times a thankless profession. But for me, that didn't matter. You know what? Like I continued on. And in, I would say it was about in fifth grade, I did <laughs> uh, my black history report on Thurgood Marshall. Uh -huh. And after that, I was like, all I want to do is learn more about this guy and other types of civil rights movements that have gone through the court system. And for me, once I got to college, um, well, high school and college, I realized that, you know, I, I, I considered depth, like all of the potential career paths that there could be to create change, you know, organizer, uh, politics, whatever it happened to be, like the whole gamma of what the whole spectrum of what it could be. And I realized that at least based on what I've learned and what I've studied that the courts have always been in a starting point for anyone, no matter what their situation is, their status, their economic well-being. It is a place where individuals have historically been able to gain profound advancements in their own individual rights despite their economic status and you know a number of other factors and for me that was very compelling and that was a reason why I chose to um, become an attorney because in this day and age it's you know, the voices of immigrants, young children, um, and even the homeless who are left out of the political commentary and who should have, and in my opinion, have constitutional rights to live in this country and should be able to assert those. So that's where I come from. No, I, love that. Now. <laughs> I love that story and I do have to say one tidbit the um there's actually a reading comprehension passage that I've taught many many times you, re you might remember it from your days studying for the LSAT that talks about Thurgood Marshall as the father yeah. of public interest law <laughs> that, when I that, heard can I just say, sorry to interrupt that was my favorite passage yeah. <laughs> that was for sure <laughs> that might be my knowledge is obviously not as deep as yours but i have taught that passage many times and it's that's why it, it just struck a chord as soon as you said that you would uh learn that in third grade the other thing that's interesting is we've talked to a few people over the past few weeks and a lot of the people that we've talked to didn't have examples or role models who were attorneys, let alone people working in public interest. So it's it's really interesting that you kind of saw that and followed in those footsteps, even if your dad was just kind of trying to push you in the, in the other direction. Yep. Um, okay, so now let's fast forward a little bit. So you went to school in California, uh, UC Santa Barbara, if I am correct. So did you do anything knowing that, that the seed had been planted and you were going to pursue something in the legal profession, something public interest related? Was there anything that you did during your college years to get ready for that? Or what advice would you give to people in those uh, similar shoes? Great question. So, I mean, I once I knew that I wanted to pursue a career in the legal field, I started taking courses that were interpreting the law for undergraduates. So um, there was a number of courses at Santa Barbara that offered that type of analysis because we had a law and society program. When I got there, it, it, it had merged into different other studies. So I was able to learn just like from those programs and those professors who are attorneys and are interpreting the law as they see it now in an academic format. So it gave me an opportunity to really learn like what the parameters of the law could be because in terms of what we do at MALDEF, you have to be very creative because a lot of times there is no case that's on point with what we wanna do. 
So you have to go outside the borders. And that is what this course taught me to be able to expand my parameters. And um, yeah, after that, I just took other courses that were about just looking at the parameters outside of the legal system that existed for individuals in the United States. That's really interesting. It's actually, uh, I think it's a really helpful piece of advice because a lot of students, they kind of think of undergrad as, you know, there's not, there's not a predefined major, there's no specific way to prepare for law school. But if you know that that's in your eventual path, you can really get kind of creative and have a lot of freedom to try different courses that might help prepare you. So I like, I actually like that approach. Um, okay, now talk to me, now fast forward a little bit more. Now I know you took a year off before actually attending law school. What did you do during that year uh, to fill your days and any advice for you that you would give to people in, the, in that similar spot? Like, should you go right after undergrad, take some time off? What are your thoughts on all that? Great question. So I would say that I would recommend everyone take time to study for the LSAT, the LSAT, because it is, and law school is a complete different approach than undergrad. Um, undergrad, when you go to your first day of classes, you're not expected to know or have read the materials. You know, you get the syllabus, it's all that. In law school, you're expected to be like on point. So I took a year off um, between undergrad and law school. Um, and I took a blueprint course and I'm super grateful I did because it was- Here's our quick plug, go blueprint. <laughs> no, and it was honestly the best. It was the best way to spend the time that I had after having graduated from, you know, having completed my undergrad and being able to study while also being able to work and not feel like there was like, like I was a burden. Like I, I, I never felt like that the blueprint course studying was interfering with my work. Like if anything, like I wanted to do more and the job was there and I was like, I wish you could get out of here today because I want to do more. So I was able to complete, you know, all of my regular blueprint requirements, but, you know, having worked and I love that blueprint gave me the option to work. You know, I, that is one thing that I learned really early on from a, a, a friend. He said, you know, you got to do this. So, Actually, I, I'm glad you said that. I always tell people study, studying for the LSAT is an interesting beast and you want to put in some time. You have to have a competitive application, but there's also something that comes out of just the exercise of studying for it. Like that kind of critical thinking, breaking down arguments. If you don't enjoy that task, that might not be a great sign for law school because they are, of course, kind of testing those same critical reasoning skills that you will use in your career. So it's a good exercise, even if you, you know, even, even, even if you decide that's not for you, uh, it can help kind of kind of pick it up and get it, get an idea for the type of material you'll be looking at. Um, I actually have, here's a, here's a question uh, from the crowd. I think this is a good one considering this right now. So uh, Erica says, I'm not sure I want to be an attorney, but I oddly feel compelled to go to law school. What can I do to, what, what advice could you give to students who just aren't really sure whether law school is the answer for them? How can they get a better idea of what that might look like? Well, I would say that, you know, the first year of law school is not the best indication of what it's like for your career to eventually be. I mean, every school from, I would say, ITT Tech School of Law to uh, Yale and Harvard, have basically the same first year curriculum. So it's not a good indication of what, the first year is never a good indication of what it's actually like to be a lawyer. Um, so I would say that it's probably a great idea to do at least do an internship or volunteer in a, in, in a law office, um, any law office, but 
more specifically in law office that you anticipate that you may go into that area of law in? Um, so that way you can just be, you know, ready on your feet because every area of law is a little bit different. Um, whether it's immigration, whether it's family law, whether it's bankruptcy, whether it's civil, whether it's criminal, every, all of those type of cases have a different baseline. And the life of those cases are completely different. So just to get exposure into one of those bases is incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable. So I would say that, and I will defer <laughs> to Matt. <laughs> I, I, I give the floor. They, uh, I, I give you that advice. You're completely correct. For students who don't know, don't go to law school without knowing that you want to be a lawyer. And how do you figure out if you want to be a lawyer? Go see what they do. And that's the, there's tons of organizations out there. It can be intimidating sometimes to pick up the phone or to approach someone, but internships, volunteers, you don't have to get paid for it. It doesn't take months and months, but get in there, see what they're working on and see if you uh, are passionate about it. Because if you're not passionate, law school can be challenging. But if you are and you're chasing a drive, something that you're passionate about, the whole process um, feels a lot better. So. Um, okay, so let's move forward a little bit. Speaking of law school, so you went to law school in LA at Southwestern. Talk to me a little bit about why you chose the school and some of the things that you really enjoyed during your time there. Absolutely. So I loved Southwestern because I knew I wanted to practice in not only Los Angeles, but on the Western Coast and in the Ninth Circuit. So for me, it's like, this is... The Ninth Circuit at least sets the tone for, like, you know, there, there, there's this saying that, you know, whatever California does, the rest of the country follows. In the legal system, it's whatever the Ninth Circuit does, the rest of the circuits follow. So for me, it was being able to practice not only in a place um, that helps set the tone for what the law is in the rest of the country, but it was also locally um, because this is my neighborhood. You know, I grew up in Southern California and for me, it was being able to create, um, a going to a school that had connections with the local community and the local judges who could, in, who could place me in, you know, opportunities to make the most effective change in my community and advocate for my community. Um, and part of that is that Southwestern's been in LA for over a hundred years. It's that, it's got that reputation. And when you go to Southwestern, it carries that name in California and especially in LA. Yeah, no, and that makes a lot of sense. And it is a, I think that's important for students. Like a lot of students will chase, they'll move halfway across the country to go to a law school that's two spots higher in the rankings. But you should really think about, you're building your network, you're making connections at these schools in the local area. You're likely to get your internships, your summer jobs in those areas. So it's definitely something to take, to take into account. Um, now I wanted to, I actually wanted to drill down on a couple things in your uh, law school career because I think this is going to be really helpful for potential students. Can you explain a little bit to people about legal clinics, like what they are, why they're helpful and what your experience looked like? Absolutely. So for me, I was in the immigration law clinic at Southwestern and I had the opportunity to have and represent clients in their U visa applications and um, there are also uh, some minors in their special immigrant juvenile visa applications. I may have been butchering the nomenclature but it's about what it is. We're all there. And I would say that those opportunities were extremely valuable because I was able to appreciate um, 
not only the power of interviewing and doing an intake and learning your client's story and asking the appropriate questions to elicit the information you need to adequately represent them, but also um, it sort of demystified the concept of being an advocate. And for me, that was extremely valuable. You know, um, our clients gave us, you know, loved us as, as if we were, you know, their, as if we were the attorneys actually on the case. And to be able to have that power and just ability to advocate for someone and, you know, knowing that your voice will somehow go forward and help the client is amazing. Even if you're not getting anything from it, it's a clinic, you're just getting units, you don't even have to go that far. You know, the fact that you did what you're doing is generally good enough, but to go above and beyond is the greatest feeling in the world. I, 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 I can't replace it. That feels. Some people will, will say, you know, what you learn in law school is very theoretical, and then you have to figure out how to be a lawyer once you graduate. But it sounds like clinics are actually where you can get some of that practical Absolutely. experience. Absolutely. Sorry, I may have gone on on a tangent. So before when you asked that question, so I'm sorry if I went beyond. <laughs> great, great so, stuff. I, have, I have another question for you here, and this is from. Uh, Erica, does law school help prepare you with good hands-on experience to learn which field you would like to focus in on? I would say, you know, every law school has opportunities for individuals to get hands-on experience. And it really all, every law school, it has different avenues for providing students that opportunity, but it doesn't matter what connections your law school has. If you are interested in something and getting experiential learning, just reach out to the organization. That's what I've done. That's what I did in law school. I, I didn't go through my law school's internship or well, what they call externship office. I just went out and did it on my own. And I sent letters to these organizations. You can find it online. That's the benefit of living in and us, you know, our generation knowing what the internet is like. And we, we can find the, the, the people that we need to connect with. You can find and, uh, <laughs> It works. It works. No, it's good advice. Law schools do what they can, but at the end of the day, right, sometimes you have to step outside and actually get into some of those offices. Uh, okay, I got more questions for you here from the crowd. Uh, we covered on this one a little bit, but just to reiterate, is it true that where you go to law school is most likely where you will end up practicing law since you're more plugged with internships, et cetera, in that area? It sounded like before your answer was yes. I would say no. I would say no, actually, because once, I mean, when it, when it comes to getting hired, you know, I, I'm at a place that I'm working in an office that generally hires people who went to the T15 school, you know, um, but my supervisor and I are Southwestern grads. And we're in our office and we're very successful. And she's in a position, she's the national senior counsel. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter. At, at the end of the day, what law school you go to, it may help in a lot of ways to get your first job or some job, right? Or even an internship, an externship. But Ultimately, it's the work that you do and your passion. If you want to go into public interest, it's your passion for the work and demonstrating that desire will get you further than anything, you know, and that, that's how I've 
that's how I've seen it. And that's how I've also recommended our office to hire individuals. So. Totally, totally makes sense. And sometimes networking, work ethic, all of that makes the difference. So. Oh, um, totally, totally, totally. Okay. Because it, it also demonstrates that committed excellence and committed desire to the work. So, yeah. Okay, I have another one for you here from Sarah. This is something that I hear from a lot of students. So I want to get your take on it. So she asks, uh, I was wondering if we have to have a pretty good idea of which field of law we are interested in when writing personal statements and applying. Um, essentially, a lot of students wonder, like, when I'm applying to law school, should I know what type of lawyer I want to be? Or is it okay to go in and still kind of be in an exploratory phase? Well, I went in in the super exploratory phase. I agree. A lot of students think like their personal statement has to be why they want to be an environmental lawyer or a corporate lawyer. And it's okay not to know that beforehand, especially you just haven't been exposed to enough. So I agree. Okay, so now let's fast forward. Uh, our next slide you will see is called Achieving the Dream. So you, of course, from an early age, uh, wanted to be a public interest lawyer. Of course, now you are. You've got a successful career, all the rest of it. But I know there was also some stops uh, in between to get to you to where you are now. So can you take us through that journey, uh, some of your internships in law school and how you eventually landed uh, at your current, at, with your current position? Absolutely. So um, for me, when I entered law school and even college, when I thought about being a lawyer, it was all about doing direct legal services. Um, and I had the opportunity to do that, um, in my volunteer opportunities in law school, but then in my first externship in law school at the inner city law center, where I was able to directly advocate for individuals in their unlawful detainer proceedings, which basically means in eviction proceedings okay. and they're def defending themselves. Um, you know, and having done direct legal services for, and then, it, and then, I'm sorry, and then after that, I was in the Southwestern Immigration Law Clinic, and I was doing, again, direct legal services. I loved the work, and I can't deny that in any way. Being able to see the joy on your clients' faces is amazing, but for me, I felt like I was only helping resolve a tiny crack in what was going on. And I wanted to put a brick and mortar over that crack and make it right. And for me, that's what I learned when in my second year, um, my second summer of law school, I externed at MALDEF, where I'm currently at. And I learned that there is this thing called impact litigation, which is different um, than, it's just a different course of being, uh, of legal practice. Um, and then after that summer, I was at the ACLU and I did a, uh, I did educational work and police misconduct work. And it was just more in the line of um, impact litigation. And so, then eventually I finished. <laughs> so for our, no, no, the, it's a great point. So when you're saying impact litigation, you're talking about um, the type of legal work where you're actually going after the systemic issues and not battling this case or that case, but you're actually getting to, to the symptoms. Correct. Okay. I like it. Okay. Uh, talk to me a little bit about clerkships. I know you did a clerkship. What are they? Tell students why are they important? Uh, and do you have any tips for people on how they might um, score a clerkship during their career? Absolutely. So I was, I, I was lucky enough to do two clerkships. Um, I was very lucky. I, um, I, my first year after law school, um, I clerked on the Central District of California for Judge Terry Hatter Jr. Um, and then right after that, um, I clerked for one year for Judge Harry Pregerson of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, he has since passed away, but I, it has been the best experience of my life. Um, 
Dre's not, you're not, you're not one to brag, but those are very prestigious positions. So. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Um, it was, uh, I would say that doing clerkships is an invaluable experience because you are in literally, you are helping the judge think out how to decide things. You're on the inner workings of the court. You are learning everything. It's, it's like civil procedure on steroids. You're getting to learn everything on, like you gotta be on it in terms of procedural things. But not only that, you need to understand how the law works at the trial court. And it's such a valuable experience to be able to see how judges think about these issues. And then knowing the knowledge of what it is that judges are looking for when you move forward in your own practice to get over whatever procedural barriers you're faced with or whatever meritorial um, barriers you're faced with. And then you can go to court, I mean, go to trial. So, I mean, for me, it's like, you just, you just get to learn the inner workings of the court and you get this sort of, you know, behind the scenes knowledge that you normally wouldn't get. That's, that makes a lot of sense. I can see that it's a tremendous advantage to see the inner workings before you're actually practicing. So any, how did you get your clerkships? Any tips for students on how they might be able to land something like that? So I would say, I mean, at least for me, um, I would say my situation is unique. Um, I didn't actually consider clerkships until my third year of law school. And then once I was in my third year, I was externing for a judge and I realized the value of being, getting that insider knowledge. So part of clerking for a judge I learned early on is the ability to just mesh on a personal level. Um, and every one of the benefits of living in this generation is every judge has a Wikipedia page. So you can learn and l a little bit about their personalities, how they are before, you know, before anything. So I personally reached out to judges who I knew I would mesh with intellectually and on our preference of you know i mean basically ideologically you know on civil rights issues and everything like that and i was grateful to work for two judges who were willing to stick their neck out um and be progressive in many ways um in advance um, positions that may not have co coincided with current precedent, but they helped push the president, the precedent to be more just and where it is today. So I got lucky. I got super lucky. <laughs> no, it's more than getting lucky and that's helpful advice. Okay, now let's keep moving. Yes. through your career, your life story here. Now, I want to dig into MALDEF. It sounds like an amazing organization. Tell, tell everybody here a little bit about the uh, mission of the organization and your time there. Thanks. Okay, cool. MALDEF stands for the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. So we were founded about 60 years ago um in texas and we were initially the first um nonprofit voice for the latino community in the country 
And at the time in Texas, there was a lot of voter suppression. And not only that, um, if uh, when you take constitutional law, you'll probably learn about this case called Plyler v. Doe. We were one of the initial filers in that case to, and in that case, um, the Supreme Court found that um, education is a fundamental right for children who came here without any choice. Their parents, uh, regardless of their parents' immigration status, they should not be deprived of an education. And it is a very important decision and we have been enforcing it since um, that came out. Now, in terms of the work that I, and, and we have, as an organization, we have four program areas. Now they are in voting rights, which is to increase and or allow us to finally have an equitable voice in the voting process. Um, we also have we have a department that's dedicated to educational rights. And then I will explain the two areas where I'm involved in. It's immigrants' rights and employment. Now, our employment cases are generally around discrimination based on an individual's immigration status or um, their race. Um, and they're discriminated against based on that. Um, we also have our immigration cases, uh, immigrants' rights cases, which have a huge branch over everything. And they really encompass all the other program areas that I've discussed. Um, but, you know, in recently, just to give you all an idea of the cases that we're working on, Maldiv has was involved immediately in the challenge to the inclusion of a citizenship question on the census. Um, we intervened on behalf of those who did not want that question when Alabama sued the federal government to include that question. Um, and we have also intervened um, in just a t a, like at least three or four of the other cases that have been brought on behalf of the state against the federal government based on the treatment of immigrants in the last Drake, we got to dig in here a little bit because it sounds like you have a habit of fighting uh, the government on these things, which I like. Um, and I am sure that the current administration has kept you guys very busy um, with all of the policies and everything in the news. So let's dig into some of these cases because I think it's fascinating work that you've been able that you've been able to do here. So explain to people. So this was front page news, right? The inclusion of this citizenship question. Explain to people out there why this was such an important challenge. Well, I, I, I so I mean, it, it goes down to the basic interpretation of the Constitution. You know, the Fourteenth Amendment says that every person has a right to the basic rights that are included in. The um, uh, the first 10 amendments, you know, the Bill of Rights. And that include and the Constitution, which includes a clause that says every person, it doesn't say every citizen, every person needs to be counted for purposes of the census. So the federal government's ability attempt to undermine the count or um, even limit what the count is, it's for us, I mean, for me, it gives me a laugh because the Trump administration and these very hardcore conservatives rely on the basic principles of what the founders would do. However, the founders included the ability to, 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 include, to include in the count everyone didn't matter who it was 
in the count for voting purposes. And that is why we have advanced this. And that, that, that was only pushed forward when the 14th Amendment was passed. So we have been pushing forward for that. And, you know, we're trying to make sure that states do not try to kick people off the voter rolls and that people, when they go to the polling place, feel confident that their vote is going to be considered and it will be considered. Like that is something that we want for everyone, so. And it sounds simple when you say it, right? That everyone's vote is gonna count and that we will have free and fair elections. <laughs> yeah, I think we are in for quite a roller coaster ride over the next couple months. We are. I mean, and Matt, I can just, I can tell you that in the last six months, we have brought, I mean, like within the state of California, California is a liberal state. We have brought three different voting rights challenges in the last six months to different jurisdictions within our own state that are discriminating, that we believe are discriminating against individuals based on their race. So it's great work. Um, okay, wait, but I want, I got to hear more about these other cases. So talk to me about, <laughs> uh, let's go to Motel 6. You got to give me a little context here and talk about what that case was all about. That's my bread and butter. So um, when I started Maldef, I was part of an investigation in which we found out that um, Motel 6 locations in the state of Arizona, there was a few locations. It wasn't just one. There was a few. And there were corporate owned who were turning over their guest list in the middle of the night to ICE upon ICE coming to the location and requesting the guest list. ICE would then look at the guest list, see what names looks like they were foreign names, Sure. and would go and basically kick in the door of whatever room um, those individuals were staying in. This generally happened between one and five in the morning. Um, and if someone who was suspected of leaving a room where there was someone who had a, you know, uh, uh, an ethnic name, they would get pinned into the parking lot and wouldn't be allowed to leave um, based on their, and they would immediately be questioned on their immigration status. So we brought a lawsuit because um, really it violates the, not only the internal policies of these companies, but it also just violates the constitution. So we brought a number of uh, claims and gratefully we were able to, we learned that this practice not only was, it wasn't located and isolated to just Arizona, it was nationwide. And we learned, and, and by doing that, we were able to settle a case. It was an $11 million settlement for victims to come forward and across the country, if you could show that you were messed with by ICE, because just because you turned your name over, you could submit a claim. And a number of individuals did. And um, anyone who did file a claim was, um, they could, they could obtain upwards, I mean, at least $200,000. That was the max, so. Wow, so interesting. I mean, look, wherever you are on the political spectrum, I think we can all agree that Motel 6 should not be the one getting involved in immigration rights, because, uh, you know, they, they have their own issues to deal with. So. Well, I mean, for, for me, internally, this is how I epitomize it. It was, if I go to a hotel, a motel, wherever it is, an Airbnb. I should be able to feel safe knowing that my personal information is not gonna get turned over so that I get messed with in the middle of the night. Yeah. 
that's a simple basic concept of not only contracting but you know everything so i mean for me even if you're on the most conservative part of the spectrum it's all about contract interpretation and this information should have never been shared under the contract signed between the company and the uh, renter. Yeah, it certainly seems like the intersection of a couple of interesting legal issues. Um, <laughs> it is, it is, but great question. I'm it's glad we, I'm glad you asked about that. Thank you. Very lightly. Well, wait, wait, I want to do the last one as well. So this is very timely. Um, the last bullet on here, so the U.S. government is sending stimulus checks all over the country, but I know you are currently involved in a lawsuit relating to those checks. Can you tell everyone about that one? Absolutely. Thanks. Great question. So, um, under the CARES Act, everyone got, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of these listeners are familiar with the Trump bucks, the $1,200 that was sent out to you know and it was, it was like a stimulus boost well for a number of families um if one of the family members one one spouse had a social security number but the under the, but the other spouse did not that family would be denied any money under the cares act including if that family had one, two, or infinite number of U.S. citizen children. So really, the government was punishing spouses where one of the spouse was filing with an ITIN, which is alternative to a social security number, and has generally been associated with individuals who are undocumented in the United States. Huh. That's very interesting. It seems like such a such an unfair way to carve out uh, the stimulus checks for a family like that. Well, I, I, and Congress did not create any exceptions or eligibility requirements on this. This was something that was done by the Department of Education post hoc about three month, about three weeks after Congress appropriated and earmarked these funds for students. And is that suit still pending? Where are, where are you with that? We, I mean, the state is, the state, right now, the state is involved uh, directly in a suit against the federal government. And we are looking into what is going on with that suit um, and potentially looking into litigating um, and joining, you know, some part of whatever happens in that suit. That's big stuff. Well, thank you for sharing the details on those. I think that gives students an excellent look. And I think, look, impact litigation. Talk about examples of impact litigation, trying to uncover these systemic inequalities. So uh, congrats to you for working on all that. Now, I do want to talk one more thing about MALDEF before we leave. I know um, that one of the reasons that you really like working there is even as a younger attorney, you get opportunities that you might not if you were at a big law firm or somewhere else like that. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? For sure. No, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, Maldives is a national organization, but we're a small outfit. There's only about 10, between 10 and 15 attorneys. And not all of us are dedicated to litigation. So when I first started at Maldives, I was thrown into the fire, into this one case. And I took seven depositions in two months um, without having any practice doing a deposition, including I did an expert deposition. But I can tell you this, I never once felt that I was unprepared to do the task that I was asked to do. Maldiv gives young attorneys 
the opportunity to take on tasks that most people wouldn't have in their, you know, depending on what year in their practice they're in, you might not get that opportunity. And if you ask for the resources, like, how can I do this? Everyone will, there will be people who will throw everything at you so that you're prepared. So I can say that as a young baby lawyer, I took a number of depositions before many of my even colleagues at Maldive had taken. Many of them hadn't taken even one deposition, but I was prepared to do so because my supervisors put me in a position to succeed and it was a task that I wanted to do. So I would say this, and this is one of the benefits of Maldive is we get the option of taking on these tasks that could be beyond our years. Like our supervisors are there to be like, hey, do you want me to do this? I know you're new to this, blah, blah, blah. But they enable us and give us the opportunity to be advocates. And one of the central rules at Maldef is if you write it, you argue it. So I've had the opportunity to argue some things that I never thought I'd have the opportunity to be on the record for. And I'm really grateful because it really empowers, um, it, as long as you don't say no and you say yes to everything, which I encourage every young lawyer to do, if you get an opportunity to try something, say yes. Um, it will advance, it, not only, it will give you more confidence to do whatever that next task is, but it, it builds on your resume and just your abilities as an attorney. So I would say, don't say no to any opportunity that is thrown your way, give it a go, and that's it. <laughs> yes, I love that advice. It's a really great point, and it's one of the benefits of working in public interest. Even at smaller law firms, you just get way more practical uh, experience. So, good point. Okay, uh, we are running short on time, but I have a few more questions from the audience for you. So, sure. one that I'd love to do is, this is a struggle that a lot of students find themselves in. Um, they listen to stories like yours, they listen to the cases that you're working on, they might be passionate about certain causes, so they are intrigued by pursuing a career in public interest law, but then at the same time, they look at law, the costs of law school and student loan debt and all the rest of that, and that combination can be really intimidating. So what advice would you give to people in that situation? You know, um... It's a totally reasonable, and I agree, it's a very legitimate concern, you know, especially right now in this day and age. Um, I would say, you know, one of the things that pushed me to do public interest law was, I mean, on the financial side, was the fact that there is loan forgiveness. Um, if you work in the practice for 10 years, it'll go by quicker than you ever thought. I'm already five years in and I didn't even realize it <laughs> until this meeting. Um, it, that, that it goes by quickly and you can get through it. Um, and it's a benefit, you know, it, and, and, you know, while the federal government, the, the Department of Education now may try to limit it, it's highly unlikely given what the ABA and every bar association across the country has argued. So, um, you know, it, it, I would say that financially, yeah, maybe you won't be able to, you know, go get sushi and steak every night, you know, but after 10 years, you won't have to worry about your loan. If, you, if you're committed to the public interest program. Yeah. Um, and then I would say, you know, there's ways of just altering and just maintaining your um, 
preference of life, you know? It's maybe you don't buy coffee every day of the week. You, you only go out and buy it five days. It's like these little things that you can do that will enable you to have a, in my opinion, a more um, rewarding life in the legal profession. Because for me, going into this was never about money. I didn't care about money. Like it, for me, it was all about, can we fix the system and make it better for the people that I care about, especially in my community. So, you know, I'm like, I knew that I was gonna go into the public interest program to resolve my loans, but I see my friends who are making way more money than me, but I don't care because I know I'm doing something that is rewarding to me. It is so rewarding. Like I can go to sleep every night and be like, yeah, I did something cool, like for, and that invigorates my passion. Whereas like, if I did some, like, and, and I'm not hating on people who go into big law. Like if you need to go to big law to pay off your loans, for, for sure, like go do that. Um, but personally for me, I couldn't spend one, two, three days doing work on behalf of a bank or an insurance company. And that's just me. That's just me. Um, no, it's great. It's great advice for students. And I think the big word you use is just passion, right? If you, if you have the passion, it all figures itself out. I think the loan forgiveness program is a really important program and everybody can look it up, see the requirements, how it all works. But that can, that can radically change things. If you're, as you noted, if you are committed to putting in some time in public interest. So good for you. Uh, five years, it goes by fast. I'm telling you. No, I'm ha I'm halfway there. I'm halfway there. I didn't even realize it. Didn't even realize it. <laughs> okay, I got a good question here from Anastasia for you. So this says, uh, since immigration cases can obviously be really difficult and emotional, what keeps you going? How do you emotionally handle or self care uh, while you're working on those cases? Ooh, very very good question. Um. So when you're working on the cases, for me, um, maybe I'm different than most of my colleagues, but I buy in and try to live the life of my clients. So, and for me, that makes it easier and I have more energy when I'm advocating for them. But on the reverse side, if we get an adverse judgment in any of our way, it hurts me to my core. Like, I just am devastated. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on what area of the law you're in. You know, for immigration context, if in immigration law, the way I have interpreted all of this is that it is a, the, the immigration statutes and regulations are written in a way to not help people become citizens or come into the country. So it's just, it's just a negative, it's an adverse statute, they're adverse statutes and regulations. So for me, I view advocating on behalf of immigrants as like, we are trying to change, not only are we advocating their position, but we're doing this in, an, in a way to hopefully fix the way that the judges interpret these generally ant, like negative statutes and regulations. Um, and it is, it, and it is exhausting when you lose. It's exhausting when you lose because I will say this, <laughs> when you win, it's like, yeah, duh, <laughs> judge. <laughs> I've been telling you this whole time I was right. <laughs> but when you lose, it is very frustrating. But if you're confident and what your position is and what the law is, then you shouldn't be discouraged to take that to appeal. You should be happy to appeal it and advocate on behalf of your client. 
And in terms of self-care, you know, it's, it's a matter of like our clients can provide us a lot of like energy, like just the fact, like sometimes like, look, I've had clients send me tamales like out of nowhere. And I'm like, Oh, that <laughs> I got so, like, just the fact that I got something in the mail. I'm like, Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> like, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's, like, while that's not technically proper to accept these things, just having the recognition that what you're doing is for the right reason or you're helping someone will fire you up more than anything in this world and will give you the confidence to do it. Um, and I definitely suggest taking time to make sure that you, as an advocate, are ready to take on those arguments. So if you need to take a break, if you need to take a day just to chill, do it, do it. If you need a few hours, do it. Um, I mean, some cases are like, uh, like unlawful, unlawful detainer cases. Sometimes they have these crazy like timelines. But if you can just take even an hour or two just to breathe and take it in, you'll be better off and you'll be a better advocate for your client. Yeah, that's good advice. You know, I wanna say first, it's an inspiring story. You're doing great work. I thank you so much for the time and sharing with us today. Um, I'm sure students found it very, very helpful. Uh, so thank you again, uh, best of luck and congrats on all the success. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate you honestly hosting this series Honestly, as a law student, I would have wished to have had something like this. So this is super baller. Keep it up. Very glad that you guys are doing something like this. So, and as a Blueprint alumni, I'm even happier. So thank you. This we is love awesome. to see where our students end up. So. <laughs> hey, and feel free to contact me at any time. And that goes for anyone who's participating in this. Um, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Thank you. That's very, that's very nice of you. All right, everybody, we're going to sign up, sign off. Dre, thank you again.